joining us. We have about 20 online right now. So uh, please put your location in the chat function as well as a word to describe a good or great mentor. Love to know what your thoughts are. Passionate is a good one. Yes. Inspired. Thank you, Heidi. Wonderful understanding. Yes. Thanks, Lindsay. Dedicated patient. I want to collect all these and do a little word jumble because I think it it speaks. I want to I want to remember this. Maybe absolutely. I think I can download the chat the chat uh, list as well, so I'll download that as well and give it to you. Perfect. That would be really nice. Adaptable, reliable, empathetic, wonderful. Yep, we're getting up there with a few more people. If you just are joining us, please enter into the chat function where you're from, as well as a brief one word trait for a good or great mentor. We'll get started in about two minutes. A listener. Mm -hmm. I think we are seeing some trends. I see a lot of patience, a lot of good listeners, dedication, empathetic. Obviously, I cannot spell. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Gladys, you have a lot on your plate right now. I think you're doing a little bit of everything. Didn't spell that so right. We're, we're going to give you some grace. <laughs> Good afternoon, Sean. All right, everyone, and welcome to the National Instructor Forum. This is our very first forum. So Mandy was gracious enough to um, be our guinea pig and kind of our kickoff um, presenter for the National Forum. Um, the idea for this National Instructor Forum is to provide a location for child passenger safety technicians and technician instructors to come, first and foremost, to get support support in what you do every day and what you do and you, you love. And second of all, to also have a place where you can come and learn more and to even collaborate with each other, to be able to, to learn more from each other as well. So um, Mandy is coming today to talk to us about mentoring. And mentoring has many forms, and she will be addressing what that looks like and what a good mentor will be. Uh, first and foremost, if you are new to uh, coming online with us today, please in the chat function, enter your location and a word to describe what you think a good mentor is, good or great mentor. We'd like to remind you, if you are uh, currently driving a vehicle, please do not uh, participate in this webinar. Please exit. We will. We have recorded this webinar, and it will be provided for you in the Child Passenger Safety Learning uh, Portal for you to view later. So we would like for you to stay safe out there. So Mandy C. Thaler uh, serves as a Deputy Director for the Center of Safe Alas Alaskans, where she oversees the operational and financial logistics of the program. Mandy has been a dedicated team member with Safe Alaskans since 2009. Beyond her duties as director, Mandy is a longtime certified child passenger safety technician and instructor. Since 2014, she has been the statewide child passenger safety coordinator for the Alaska Highway Safety Office 
and is the designated NHTSA CPS training contact for Alaska. Mandy serves nationally as the Community Engagement Representative for the National Child Pastor Safety Board and is a past chair as well. So we'd like to welcome Mandy. Thank you, Claudia. I'm so glad to be here today. All right, we've got the screen up and everything. Okay, well, welcome to the first National Instructor Forum event. I'm so excited to, to join you today on this journey. You're going to see a lot of roads. Um, I feel like it was a, a journey we could all take together. Um, we're already sharing in the chat some of our favorite or great qualities about a mentor, but if you'd like to share where you're at in your instructor journey or if you've been an instructor for a long time, I would love to hear about that as well. As Claudia mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the statewide CPS coordinator for the Alaska Highway Safety Office and the community engagement representative for the National Child Passenger Safety Board. I've been a technician since 2010 and an instructor since 2012. I'm extremely excited to be involved in the upcoming curriculum revision, but um, that's a teaser for another time. So today we're going to explore mentoring for technicians and instructors. Mentoring plays a crucial role in the professional development of all individuals. It impacts our job performance. It's been shown to increase engagement. It's an effective tool for leadership development. It facilitates knowledge sharing and succession planning. It creates a more diverse and inclusive work environment, and it fosters meaningful connections. So let's get started. Next. So just for fun, it felt like we should start with a snapshot of our, our CPS community, which is thriving. Although it is a little risky to share numbers this early in a presentation, right? <laughs> but our numbers are climbing. And that means that all of you are working hard and you're very busy. But it does emphasize the need for mentors, for our technicians and our instructors, so they can continue to save lives and prevent injuries by promoting child and passenger safety worldwide. So at the end of last week, we had just over 36,000 technicians. And of those, 1,700, um, 1,729 were instructors, 38 instructor candidates. Woohoo! good for you. I'm excited to, to see a bunch of you get on board. And we also have 735 technician proxies. That is a fabulous number, and I'm really excited to, to celebrate that. And um, you guys are doing some really great work. So as of the NDCF reporting, there were 178,405 seat checks reported through the NDCF. So those numbers are climbing. Not too long ago, the goal was 100,000 checks, and we're well past that now. And again, with the work that you instructors are doing in um, the works for 2024 are 289 courses. So we have a lot going on. Next slide. So <laughs> it turns out that if you're taking a new road, the best experts are often the worst guides. There are reasons that experts struggle to give good directions to beginners. One is the distance they've traveled. They've come too far to remember what it's like being in their shoes. It's called the curse of knowledge. The more you know, the harder it is to fathom what it's like not to know. Can you imagine not locking a seatbelt or using the tether? Um, so as you become skilled at your work, your ability to communicate um, your understanding or to help others understand that skill often worsens. So think about when you're when you're teaching a course and you're showing the, the class how to install um, or use a locking clip or to install a, a car seat that's pretty challenging. Do you ever say, oh, you're, you're going to get it. I'm going to let you put your hands on it. You're going to get it. It's going to be fine um, because it becomes hard to articulate all the little details. What are those things that are happening in your mind? Because it's intuitive for you. You're doing it without even thinking about it. So we all need to slow down and think about what are actually all of those steps. And doing that will help us become better mentors. Next. So before discussing mentoring, let's reconnect with how adults learn. And you know that our curriculum is also based off of this concept, the adult learning theory. We model this in our curriculums, Learn, Practice, Educate. Did you catch that? <laughs> we do more than explain. We are educators. So let's create a touchstone for today. And this is why we do some of the things we do in mentoring. The adult learning theory was developed by Malcolm Knowles based on a self-directed, independent learning method for adults. This theory asserts that learning programs must support the notion that adults are self-driven, they take responsibility, 
and it makes the following assumptions about the design of learning. Adults need to know why they're learning something. Why does that seatbelt need to be locked? Why shouldn't it move more than an inch? Why do we need to use the tether? They need to understand these concepts, not just say, hey, you'll get it at some point. They need to learn experimentally. Why do they need to practice um, using that manual? What value can they gather out of, out of using it? They need to practice installing that seat rear facing in that tiny little back seat. By experimenting, they're going to gather their own thoughts and processes, and then they're going to approach it as a, a problem solving activity. What does it mean to you when you figure something out? In my experience, when I do a, a car seat check with a family, if they try to install the car seat first and then come to me, I feel like they're more receptive to the information I have to provide. Hey, you did a really great job doing it this way, but let's take a minute and let's make a few changes and let's teach you a few things that you can do differently um, and get get a little bit better installation. Um, but I feel like they're more receptive. So um, adults approach learning as problem solving. They need to solve a problem. Every time they turn the corner, that car seat falls over. Every time this instructor goes to this course, they can't quite remember how to explain a dynamic latch plate. You know, they need to learn for a reason. Um, so we want to, to give them a reason. Let's, let's talk about what problem this is going to solve and how this is going to benefit you. Adults also learn best when the topic is of immediate value. This is why it's essential when you're done with your course to have a plan. What are you going to do with these skills? What are your next steps? How can you use that this week, tomorrow? Um, how can you take this to the checkup event and, and use it? But the topic needs to be something that they can use right away. We want to make sure that they're, they're using those skills too. Let's check out those car seats. Next slide. So this slide is jumbled on purpose. I don't want you to focus too much about it, but let's talk about a few of the learning principles. So self-directed, learning at your own pace in your own way. We need to remember that adults, we set our own style of learning. What do we need to do? What's our goal? Is our goal just to sit through the class and be done with it? Is our goal to actually learn something? Is it for ourselves? Is it for our job? Based on our, our self-direction, we will decide how immersed we're going to become. What are we going to do? What materials are we going to, to have with us? What's our plan? And a good mentor can help you with those, those steps and that plan processing. This is one of my favorites, transformational learning principle. Learning can change your perspective. And doesn't that apply to everything? <laughs> um, so new learning can shift a person's view and challenge their preconceived notions. Did you ever think that car seats could be this confusing? Has your view shifted? Are you more patient with those that are new? Are you more patient with those caregivers? I am. <laughs> um, the experimental principle focuses on developing life experiences for hands-on for adult learners. Adult learners need to physically participate and our car seats and our teaching, it's all physical. You know how hard it is to stand up in front of a classroom and demonstrate how to install a locking clip? How many times did you have to do it your first class before you could get it right on that demonstration seat? You know, it's kind of wiggly, um, but we need to practice. We need to get our hands on and then we can reflect on what worked and what didn't work. Going back to the locking clip, did you learn to lock the, the wheels on the, the demo seat? You know, we, we learn what, what works and then it's reinforced where we had some positive or some great feedback. Um, and this, again, embodies child passenger safety. Giving it a try is, is what really works for us. So learning from a, a mentor or mentorship in the field, um, we learn from each other. The mentee is going to ask us questions. How do you do this? What do you do? And when we have to explain it to someone, it's just like the learn, practice, explain model. That's how we learn as well. It reinforces our own learning, especially when they challenge that learning. Well, that's great, but why? Why? You know, let's talk about the why. Why does it need to move less than one inch? Why does this need to be locked? Why can't I use the, the lower anchor than the seatbelt? We need to challenge each other. So our orientation to learning. Adults need to reframe their emotions and assumptions around the experience and the value of learning. Educators instruct their students on how to apply the new lessons in the real world and the real work, which helps them retain the information. We practice this through our Learn Practice Explains and Skills 4. When you have that student that comes in there, they're voluntold to be in class. They've got to reframe their emotions. They've got to find a reason 
They have to, to get past that assumption. Car seats are easy. It's not that hard. Why can't they do this? Why do I need a three-day class? Why do I need a five-day class? Um, finding a, an orientation to the learning is essential. So motivation to learn. Um, our children are motivated by their their teachers and other caregivers and other adults. But as a, as adults, as learners, we need some sort of internal um, motivation. If we're going to put in the time and the effort, we need a reason. <laughs> um, we need a reason to come to class for several days. And the activity where we practice installing a, a car seat early, early in the, the curriculum, it really helps some of us um, find that motivation. You know what? That was a lot harder than I thought. I've never seen a car seat before. I've never taught someone how to put a car seat in before. You know, it really helps us find our own motivation um, because many people don't realize how challenging it can be to install an unfamiliar seat correctly. So we need to also be in a place for um, readiness to learn. Thanks, everyone, too. Um, we need to rely on our, our past experiences to develop a readiness to learn. And you take this back to a car seat check. When your families come in, um, if the, the car seat is falling over, they're like, I just, I just can't do it. They are ready for you to say something. Our new parents are always the most fun because they are just dying for this little baby to come into their life. And they're in a spot where they're really receptive to the information. It's also a time when we can share a little bit more information and what do we share? Where is that line? Do we, do we stop here? Um, what are they open to and willing? But Sometimes a new job for those of us that are going to take on teaching. Um, sometimes it's new opportunity. What is our what is our readiness to learn? Where are we coming from? So remembering these principles can help us be better mentors because we can reframe our approach. How can we help mentor? Next. So mentoring is a collaborative relationship between experienced individuals, a mentor, and the less experienced. Um, and this is aimed at personal and professional growth. And for me personally, I can't I can't separate the personal and the professional because I think that they are tied together. So it involves a sharing of knowledge, skills, insight, and guidance to support achieving a goal, overcoming a challenge, realizing full potential. Because we have some superstars out there. I've been lucky enough to read some of the award nominations, and wow, wow. We are an impressive community and our instructors are the cream of the crop. So a great mentor is someone who possesses some of the following or most of the following qualities. And many of you mentioned that in the icebreaker this morning. Um, I, in fact, I think almost all of these were on your list. So I was I was wiping my brow. I was experiencing a little bit. Of, whew, I think we got them all. So expertise, like all of you, you have an expert knowledge or a significant knowledge in the field, and you can provide guidance and insight. That doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but it also means that you can show a technician or instructor how to figure it out. Empathy, oh my goodness, empathy is huge. We demonstrate an understanding and compassion and empathy towards creating a supporting and nurturing environment. None of us want to be in an environment where we don't feel supported. It's, it's good for our growth. It's good for our development. We really want to make sure that we are providing that for those that we we mentor. Mentors are great communicators, um, and this takes practice. This is not intuitive to all of us. Um, they communicate clearly, effectively. They're active listeners. They can provide constructive feedback and offer some practical advice and solutions. You know, we don't want to get too complicated. We want to keep things simple, but we need to have some, some cards in our back pocket that we can help out those technicians and instructors. Accessibility. This was my favorite. Um, they're approachable and accessible, and they make themselves available for guidance, support, and regular meetings. We're going to emphasize this a few times throughout this presentation. Accessibility. Don't be afraid to come to your mentor, and as a mentor, make sure that you are available um, for those that you're helping out. So our mentors are all role models. They lead by example. They embody the qualities and behaviors they wish to instill. They are inspiring and they personally strive for excellence and personal growth. If you were doing it, those that follow you will do it as well. So encouragement. We all want to be in a positive environment, right? We want our mentor to be our biggest cheerleader. So mentors inspire and motivate their mentees. They encourage them to set goals, overcome challenges, and again, reach their potential. So accountable. A good mentor 
We'll also make sure that their mentee is is reaching their goals, that they're doing what they need to do, um, that they are accountable for their actions, for their commitments, that they stay focused and disciplined, and um, they're responsible for their own goals. So we're going to work together on that. Adaptability. Now, the world has been crazy for a few years, so adaptability is something we all need to learn to pivot. <laughs> I think that was the, the word that we all used for a while. Um, but great mentors, they are flexible and adaptive, and they tailor their mentorship approach to the individual. You know, we're all a little bit different, and what we are <laughs> successful in is, is, really, is really key. So let's make sure that, that we can pivot. Trustworthiness. There has to be trust. There has to be um, rapport. You've got to maintain confidentiality when it's needed, respect from boundaries, and always, always act with integrity. And remember that mentorship is a long-term commitment. We're not doing it for today. We're not doing it for this month. We are here for the long haul. Next. So what are some of the benefits of mentoring? You know, it, it feels like a lot of this is really obvious, but sometimes just pointing it out, it, it recenters you. It's like, OK, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be a better mentor. Um, so knowledge transfer. Mentoring facilitates the transfer of skills, um, expertise, and it's going to transfer from our, our new students to um, our instructors to our new students. And one of my favorite examples of this is making banana bread. So if there's a recipe for banana bread in my technician guide, I can follow that recipe. I can put it out. But my mom has passed along the knowledge that those bananas have to be extra ripe to make the best banana bread. But that is passed on and I need her assistance and I need her to mentor me through the baking process to make sure that I get it done correctly. So skill development. Mentoring provides opportunities to develop technical skills, communication ability, problem solving. The other day I had a technician um, on my team and she identified that she needed a locking clip. And I'll tell you what, internally we were all doing cartwheels. She did it, she identified that she needed it correctly. She taught the caregiver how to do it in a rear facing convertible outside when the temperatures were not ideal. But she figured it out on her own and we traded some text messages and some photos um, and she was, she was so happy. And doing that really helped develop her technical skills. She knew where to look for the information. She did some problem solving and I, I was glowing. She, she really exceeded. So career advancement. Great mentoring can open doors and it's not just in child passenger safety. The skills that we develop and the relationships that we develop can open doors to new opportunities, new wet work, networks <laughs> and um, resources. So look at this long list of attendees. Everyone on this list is going to be a mentor to you. And I guarantee you could contact any person that's attending today and they will help you out. So your community has grown. If you need help, holler. So personal growth. Mentoring promotes personal growth by building confidence, resilience, and a positive mindset. Think about all the things that you do as a technician and instructor, all the things that you learn to do. How do you use those other skills in other aspects of your job, in other aspects of your home, or your school, or your community? I think that we use them all kinds of ways. Next. So sometimes we find ourselves inadvertently becoming a mentor without even realizing it. Whether it's offering advice, sharing experiences, providing guidance to another technician or instructor, these informal mentorships can be incredibly valued. And what's remarkable is that we don't often recognize the extent of our support until someone expresses gratitude or acknowledges our impact. So having multiple mentors can provide a diverse range of perspectives and insights, enriching our own learning and our growth journey. Each mentor brings a unique experience, expertise, wisdom, and they contribute to a holistic and a well-rounded approach to personal and professional development. Embracing the idea of being a mentor and a mentee can lead to a richer exchange of knowledge, support, and encouragement within our, our personal and our professional networks. So there's several types of mentoring programs. One is the group, and you can see that I've included a classroom. This was a, a CPS update as a, a photo. Have you ever thought about this as a mentoring opportunity? You know, we think that we're up there teaching and we're providing some information, but you are mentoring. You're teaching our new technicians how to share information, where to get information. They're creating network opportunities with those that are in the class. Um, because this could be your teaching team. This could be CPSTs in your state. Um, 
And those mentors are, are there for you. And don't we all have a go-to person? Because we value them in their various um, areas of expertise. I have several go-to people. I contact all kinds of people for all kinds of reasons. But group mentoring can be like in a classroom, like on the screen, or it can be a national group where you meet. Um, I think that there's some online forums for CPS instructors. That's that's actually mentoring. We're mentoring each other. We're helping each other out, and we're developing those relationships and um, professional development opportunities. So we do seek our mentors for their various um, areas of knowledge, car seat knowledge, program knowledge, other vehicle transportation, Denise and school buses. Um, we're looking for those that can help in their areas of expertise. So when you have multiple mentors, or if you are part of a multiple mentor team, um, you need to make sure that you all work together and complement each other. And we're gonna uh, take a step away from the positive for just a second and think about triangulation with multiple mentors. Um, triangulation between three people refers to a dynamic of interpersonal relationships where one individual involves a third to address or influence a situation or a conflict. Um, and we don't we don't want to create those kinds of situations. Well, she told me it goes this way and he told me it goes this way and you keep going kind of back and forth with with different people. So we want to work together as a mentorship team. Um, and there's an easy fix. So just have open and direct communication. Get everybody on the phone. Look at how easy it is for us today to have such a large group together. Just take a few minutes. Hey, I've got some conflicting information. Can you help me share, figure out what the, the correct answer is? You're telling me one thing. I'm hearing another thing. I really need some help. So let's avoid some triangulation and have some positive, um, engaging communication um, with all of our mentors together. Again, easy, easy fix. Informal mentoring, give a little shout out to Scott Downing um, right there in the middle. He's talking to a technician at a car seat checkup event. Um, this was a technician certification course. And, you know, you don't look at that as a mentoring opportunity, but it really is. He's solidifying his relationship with that technician, letting them know that they can come to him with any questions that they might have. He's sharing his expertise and his knowledge. Um, but he's he's making a, a natural connection because it just comes up. You're, you're sharing common interests. You've got a goal. You're going to get that car seat check done. You're going to certify that technician. So it's really an opportunity um, to informally create a new a new connection. And lastly, we do have our formal mentoring. And that's something, again, as we continue through, we're going to talk about setting up a formal mentoring plan with you as the mentor or you as the mentee. And I've um, got some ideas. but. If you have any, I'd love to hear those too. And we're gonna make it easy. We're gonna make it achievable. Next slide. So are you looking to expand your mentors? <laughs> I'm famous for giving a few plugs here. So in addition to the entire CPS community, the National Child Saf Passenger Safety Board is committed to mentorships. It is one of the pillars of the board's mission. You can reach any board member. The contact information is shared at cpsboard.org. And I bet that your instructor team and the other technicians in your state all feel the same way. But please don't hesitate to reach out. So as you think about being a technician and an instructor, how do you include these qualities in your interactions, even if it doesn't feel like a, a formal mentoring meeting? So you should have experience. Mentors should possess a wealth of knowledge and hands-on experience. If you don't feel like you have that experience, Go give it a try. All of us have a few training materials we can share. Webinars, CEUs, there's a million ways that you can gain the experience you need to feel confident as a mentor. Empathy, we talked about this earlier, but it's crucial. It allows us to understand and connect with the experience and struggles of our mentee. You know, if they're having a hard time with a, a family or a car seat or having too many appointments in one day, we need to have some empathy and show our support. The, me, the support should be meaningful and welcome, and it should positive, positive, foster a positive outcome. Oh, Tammy, we're going to stop for just a second and give some love. She created a, a word jumble of all of our, our mentor um, descriptions. Patience, we're going to go back to this one more time because it's vital for mentors enabling them to support and guide their mentees as they learn and grow with their own pace. Being patient and understanding will create a nurturing environment where mentees feel comfortable and they'll explore their abilities and their skills. So this is a story that's been around for, well, since the 1950s. 
Um, and I think it really helps explain availability. So there's a, a gentleman driving down a little country road and he has a flat tire, gets out of the car, looks underneath and doesn't have a jack. He's like, oh, I need a jack. And he looks down the road and he sees a farmhouse and lights are on. He's like, hey, let's go down to the neighbor and I'll borrow my jack and or borrow his jack. And I'm sure he'll be glad to lend it to me. So the gentleman starts walking down the road and then the lights go off in the farmhouse. And then he starts thinking, oh, man, I'm going to wake him up. And if I wake him up, he's going to he's going to want to charge me something for this jack. And he's probably not going to want to give it to me. And, you know, he's just developing this little internal monologue about all the terrible things that can happen. Well, as he continues his walk and gets to the farmhouse, he's continued to, to think of all the reasons that this this farmer family is not going to want to lend him a jack. They're going to want money for it and they're going to be agitated. So he's really developed this this agitation already. So he gets to the farmhouse and he bangs on the door. And he's like, hey, the farmer's like, how can I help you? The guy's like, I don't even want to borrow your jack. You can just keep it. What are you talking about? So what this comes back to is don't be afraid to reach out because what you think the reaction might be is not what it's going to be. And I guarantee if you reach out to the CPS board or the instructors in your state, they are going to be willing to help. So do you want to borrow a jack? You sure do. And we've got one to lend. We're going to we're going to boost you up and, and help you out. Next slide. OK, so sorry, one more story. I have the most amazing sister. I adore my sister and um, we have a relationship where we talk two or three times a week and we've been close since we got out of high school. There's a lot of trust there. There's a lot of history, but there are days when we'll get on the phone. And we'll just skip all the pleasantries. Hi, how you doing? It's like, hey, sis, I, I need to vent. What that does is it lets my sister know or it lets me know that, hey, I've got something I need to get off my chest. I really don't need to find a solution. I just need to talk about it. And it sets the expectation for that conversation. There are other days we'll get on the phone. And we'll say, hey, hey, I got to tell you about this. I want to share this. Yep. Um. And so we also know it's a space where we can share some of our joys. Like I really enjoy cooking and every once in a while it turns out great. So I'm like, hey, I just made this last night and I'm really excited about it. But it's a safe space where I can share great things and not feel not feel like I'm bragging. I'm, I'm just sharing this really wonderful thing that happened to me. So as you begin your conversations, you know, clearly there's some emotional you can tell what's going on. Hey, this technician's having a, a really hard day or, hey, this is working. But what we want to do is we want to be brave and, and ask the question before we get too far in the conversation. Hey, do you want me to, to listen? Do you need to vent or can I help you problem solve? Because we need to know if we're going to listen, which is the art of understanding, or are we going to problem solve? So this is where as a mentor, you begin to hone your skills. So the art of listening this is paying attention, receiving and comprehending the information. It involves actively engaging with the speaker, focus on their words, their tone, their body language. We're going to be empathetic. We're going to listen to understand and connect with them more deeply. It fosters mutual respect. It um, creates trust and it enhances our relationship. This is not the time to share when something similar happened to you. We are being open and we are listening. The problem solving is the science of resolution. It's a process of analyzing, evaluating, and finding solutions to a challenge. Hey, I need you to help me figure out how to get this locking clip on. I cannot get the seatbelt to lock. What am I supposed to do? It requires critical thinking, creativity, systematic identification, and resolution of the issues. Problem solvers are adept at breaking down problems into manageable parts and considering multiple perspectives. Problem solving leads to innovative solutions, efficiency, and growth. So what are some of the key differences there? Listening focuses on understanding the perspective, the emotion, and the concern. I really can't figure this out. I really need some help. Problems focus, problem solving focuses on analyzing for a specific issue or a challenge. I need your help to do this. So we really want to make sure we're, we're listening. To what their intent is. Sorry, I need to finish that, that thought. So listening is an ongoing process that involves active listening, paraphrasing, ask for clarification. Problem solving follows a more structured approach. 
<laughs> um, problem identification, analysis, solution generating, implementation. So the outcome is that um, we improve communication and we enhance our relationships when we listen. Through problem solving, we find a solution and we overcome an obstacle. While they share similarities, they are distinct skills with different focuses, processes, and outcomes. And by understanding and developing both skills, we can become effective communicators, decision makers, and collaborators. This will teach us both. So let's embrace the powering of listening and problem solving and unlock some new possibilities. We're going to achieve greater success in our personal and professional endeavors if we just ask, do you want me to listen or do you want me to problem solve? And you can find your own words. And if you have a great phrase, I'd, I'd love to hear it. My sister and I, it's I want to share or I want to vent. So if you have something great, please let us know. Next. OK, so now we're here. So what do we do? How do we get started? First, I want to say let's not let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not make it too much. We're going to simplify, simplify, simplify. So we've got all these things going on, on this page. What are we going to do here? So there's this joke about about CrossFit and I, I haven't done it lately, but I, I do have a, a little bit of a CrossFit um, background and there's a lot of mental lessons that come with doing this. So um, there's this workout and it's called the Filthy 50 and it's a timed workout where you 50 reps of 10 different mov movements. One of those is burpees, 50 burpees. If you haven't done one before, it's it's this really, really terrible, beautiful, effective movement. Anyway, the first time that I saw this program in class, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. The volume of work, 500 exercises, was just overwhelming. So I learned the art of scaling, setting small, realistic, and achievable goals. Scale. Instead of 50, I did 10. I achieved it. <laughs> yes, we all have burping nightmares. <laughs> So I recommend you scale your mentoring plans and your mentees goals to what you can actually achieve. Think about that. What can you actually achieve? And if it's easy, that's OK. So don't say you're going to meet every week for an hour and we're going to accomplish this really long list. Meet once a month for for 30 minutes, but stay committed and never miss. All right, next. It's all kinds of burpees, right? <laughs> but what we're going to do is first we're going to break this into a few small bites. You know, we're going to talk about this um, initial getting started, um, practice our skills, our networking, what kind of materials do we need, how do we recertify. But see, already we're breaking it up into small little pieces that we can make goals, that we can think about, and we can break it up. How do we keep current? What are our next steps? Where do we want to go with this? So it feels like a lot, but when you break it up into these little tiny pieces, it feels achievable, right? We are going to scale this to something that we can do. All right, next slide. Okay, so, you know, as the, the speaker, you always learn the most. Oh my goodness, I got done with this and I'm like, I'm going to change everything. <laughs> um, this is the first half of a contact sheet. And so this is um, this is actually my information. Um, you can write down my cell phone number and you can contact me anytime you want. I'd be glad to help you with anything you've got going on. And this is going to sound really silly, but do this sheet every time you get together. And you're going to laugh because the first two lines are, what's your name? Um, but not a lot of people do their own registration for classes. So did they use their formal legal name? My name happens to be Amanda. Um, what do I like to be called? I, I think if somebody called me Amanda, I wouldn't I wouldn't turn my head. So my name is Mandy. And how do you spell it? You know, we all we all want to feel like someone cares about us. So getting the spelling correct, it, it makes a difference, right? What is the preferred phone number? Again, this stuff sounds so basic, but we're going to be successful, right? I want to be called on my cell phone because I carry it around with me all over. And if I'm offsite or working remotely that day, I can always get to the phone. And what is the preferred email? So again, how we were registered, maybe it was a group email or maybe we've changed jobs. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. Um, you know, we, we need to know where do you want to be contacted and is texting OK? You know, if it's my office work line, I can't get a text there, so I need to know whether or not I can text and if they're open to to doing that. I included the original cert date on here because I think it's important to recognize the history and the long term dedication of our techs. There are so many that have served for so long and have a huge history that have been through several cycles of the certification 
They've seen things come and go. They have a rich history. They're going to be able to pass along that knowledge that we talked about. They know that the bananas need to be ripe, right? We've got it. We've got to get that information. Current expiration date. You're going to want to revisit this to make sure you're caught up on when do they recertify. Um, location. So for me, I, I have a state and I have a city, um, but you guys have counties and boroughs. You have regions. Everybody has kind of a different location. Um, so you're going to want to know where where's your technician, where's your instructor candidate, where's your your mentee, where are they doing the majority of their work. This is going to help you connect them with other resources in the state, other resources in the community. Who do they need to talk to? Um, or if you're traveling through your area, it's a good time to stop by and say hello. The next thing you want to do, and this is really important, set up a regular meeting schedule. And then stick to it. Don't miss. Don't miss for any reason. It's hard. It's hard, right? We're we're inundated with meetings and opportunities and changes. But and then I listed on here what would be important to me. How are we going to meet? What is the platform? Make sure we can both access that platform. Is it um, Teams? Is it Zoom? When do we want to do it? Um, I just put these quarterly. It looks like I missed one. Oh, nope, I just missed a, a. Wow, my brain is just gone. Anyway, decide when your meetings are going to be and commit to it. I committed to an hour once a quarter. I think that's a really great structure. And then next, talk about the CPS involvement. What is this technician, this instructor? What's their general connection to CPS? Is it their entire job? Is it something they're doing on the side for their community? Are they a volunteer? Are they doing this 24 hours a day? You need to get a general feel for why they are doing this because they're going to need to apply that information right away, right? We're going to go back to our adult learning theory. Why are they doing this and what do they have an immediate need for? So I just listed a few things. We have an active fitting station here in my office. I'm praying that the doorbell doesn't ring because I think there's a car seat check coming in here in a little while. All right, next slide. This is the fun one. This is how we make being a mentor or being a mentee simple. So I created three different categories and I thought about it. We have some new new team members. I'm like, what would be really important to help them be successful? So I came up with goals, recommended CEUs or community education and resources to explore. And I broke this up into quarters because that's how we're meeting. So I would update this form every time you get together. So I'm going to break it up into a tiny piece. What do I want to accomplish this quarter? Now I realize that whoever I'm, I'm mentoring, they're going to have a billion other things to do, right? So I want to keep this short and very, very relevant. So in Q1, it's really cold where I live, I'm going to attend one event in person. And then I can use that as a mentor to talk to myself. Where are those events happening? Where can I find events in my state? How do I locate an event? Okay. My next goal is that I want to complete all of my recertification requirements. So I would talk to my mentor and say, hey, what do I need to do in Q1 that will help me achieve this by the end of the year? I'm not a girl that can wait until the end of the recertification cycle. It gives me a heart attack. OK, and then I wanted to also make it specific. So I want to practice and I want to learn more about tables in the National Digital Check Form on their website. But that's a specific thing I want to learn. I didn't just say I want to learn about the NDCF. I want to learn a specific thing. So my mentor could help me find training resources. It could help my mentor could help me find other people that know who's an expert. Help me find out about that one thing. OK, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think about CEUs and communi community education. Pardon me, one second. I want to think about it in a different way. I am not doing these just so that I can recertify. I am using community education and community CEUs to enhance my CPS knowledge. So when we take the certification course, we're becoming basic technicians, right? We can't teach everything everyone could possibly ever know. We, we don't want to do six month courses, right? So what would be really essential for me to be better at my job in the area that I work? So I went into um, the CPS learning portal, carseateducation.org, and I picked three. The Learn with PG I've, I've just done. Sorry about the why, Daniela or Denise. Um, but I missed this um, UN car seat regulations CEU, and I really want to go back and take it. So I put it in my cart, and it's there. All I got to do is start taking it. The Kiko update, I see a lot of them in my area. This would be really important for me. So I'm going to go take those three. So I have committed to taking one each month of this quarter. But again, it's not it's not because I need to recertify. It's because I want to be a better technician. So talk to your mentee. 
what do you need to learn? What do you see in your area? Do you see a lot of pickup trucks? Are you having trouble with lower anchors? Do you, what do you see in your area that would help you? There are, I think, 74 combined CEUs and community education opportunities at carseateducation.org. You like those plugs, Tammy? <laughs> but you can find what is relevant for your technician or your instructor in that portal. So find three and then commit to it. The next, and I, I made a mistake with my own team this way. Um, I told them, hey, go in and look at the board website. Well, holy cow, that's hard, right? So when I thought about resources to explore, I thought I need three really specific things to explore. So on the CPS Learning Portal, I'm going to go in and I'm only going to look at what manufacturers offer an update. That's all I'm going to do. I can do that, right? I can spend 10 minutes. And then the next time I get a car seat check, I'm going to say, you know what? That manufacturer had a CEU. I need to go watch that so I can learn how to use that, that even full revolve, right? So I made it really bite-sized because trying to explore the whole thing is too much. Um, the Safe Kids Certification course, I want to revisit the course administration page. There's a lot of really great information. I haven't read it in a while. I need to revisit. But again, that's small because on that website, there's like a hundred things I could download and, and read, right? And then that's too much. That's too many burpees. I want 10, maybe. And then on the, um, the CPS board, the resources page, there is an accordion file. I think that there's 14 different accordions that you can open up. All I want to do is I want to see what's available. Because the next time I need that information, I'm going to say, hey, I remember there being something here about it. So instead of saying, hey, explore the CPS board website, explore this one page. So through these goals, recommended CEUs, and resources to explore, I feel like this is something that I could actually accomplish. None of this takes very long. It would be just a few hours over a few months, and I think that I could do it. So when you have your mentorship, meeting your quarterly meeting go back and write down each one of these did you attend a local event did you complete your a little bit of your research what did you complete so make some notes because that's going to come back to our agenda next slide claudia we have the simplest agenda ever if it is too much you won't do it right so glows hey i accomplished six things of the nine things that i wanted to do on my on my goals list grows I learned that I need to set aside time every Tuesday afternoon for one hour to do something on this list. My goals, I've written them out on the previous page. I know exactly what they are. So CEUs, we're gonna plan for the next quarter or my community um, education. Here's a great time for you guys to go in and look together or you can talk about some of the struggles that you're having. Hey, this car seat came in and I, I don't know how to do it or hey, I'm struggling with giving presentations. Let's go see if there's something that we can learn because there's so many sites that have some great, great training materials. There's a Car Seats 201 and there's the Web We Weave and then there's the EMS. You know, there's, there's such a wide variety. What are you struggling with in your grows that we can address with some of the information that's already available to you? You don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to say, well, I guess I'll pull out my technician guide and I'll start reading. No, there's some brilliant, brilliant people and most of them are on this call that have already created this content for you and can help. And then we're gonna talk about what resources. Here's what you've explored. Now let's find something new. Let's go find one new page on each of those three websites and just read it, take 10 minutes. Next, we wanna talk about events that are happening in your community, in the state, in the nation that you can attend. Does this include Lifesavers? Is this an online CEU opportunity? What have you got that you can attend? Or is it literally an event? It's a car seat check that I have coming in here in about half an hour. That's an event. So talk about the things that are coming up. But see how easy that was? In just a couple of minutes, we can run through the entire agenda. It's achievable, it's scalable, and it's something that we can do. So you come into this meeting knowing that, hey, I'm not gonna get called into the carpet. I'm not gonna be intimidated. This person wants me to grow and succeed, and we are going to do it this way. And I know it's coming every single time. Okay, next slide. Okay. <laughs> How many of you have done this? Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> so if you find yourself in a situation where you're telling technicians, oh, this is what I do, but not what you should do. Follow my words, not my actions. Listen to my advice. I know you're all doing this because we, we have done it. But you know what? Here's some important steps that you should take to not do this. Take some time to reflect on your own behavior. Why are you doing this? 
why aren't you why aren't you practicing what you preach? Um, some self-awareness is, is crucial for making change. Lead by example. You're a mentor. You're, you're the leaders in our CPS community. Make a conscious effort to align your actions with your words. Show your team you're willing to do what you ask of them. Have an open and honest communication with your team about the importance of leading by example and explain why it's important for us to all follow the same standards. Provide support and resor resources. Ensure that they have the tools. So I just blanket loaded a lot of, of resources that we have available to us. And if someone comes to you, excuse me, and asks a question, you should be able to say, this is where I found it. This is where that information is available. Here's where you find the instructions on how to do it. If we are making up our own instructions, we probably need to go back and revisit the materials that are already available. You know, over the last few years, so many guides and templates and resources have become available for us. It's making our job easy. We don't have to recreate the wheel. So take some time and say, you know what? The answer to that question is right here. It is in the hybrid administration. It is in the code of conduct. This is why we're doing it. So remember that as a leader, you're setting an example and all the answers are already designed for you. So all of the information you should be supplying should be accessible and easy to find for everyone. Oh, next slide. So mentorship plays a vital role in personal and professional development, offering guidance and support, opportunities for growth. By leveraging your expertise and experience, technicians and instructors can navigate challenges more effectively. They can achieve their goals and they'll be more confident and they'll feel your love because we all know that you are all supporting everyone. So getting started as a mentor can be easy. You only do a few burpees. It does require a willingness to learn, connect, and engage with others to provide or receive guidance. I hope this helps you take your first steps. So again, my name is Mandy. Um, here is my cell phone number. You can text me or email me at every time, at any time. Um, and then I included a couple pictures of my my little Mr. Misuse, um, kind of a pun on the game from last night, Mr. Irrelevant. This is Mr. Misuse. Um, my kid's always in his car seat wrong. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening. I hope that you found something valuable. And um, thanks again for joining us. And I think we have a, a couple of minutes for some questions. Claudia, if anybody's got any. Absolutely. Feel free to, you know, you can lift your hand <laughs> up in the, in the teams or you can say something in chat. We're happy to uh, provide that to Mandy. Yes, go ahead, uh, Nicole. Make sure you're on, uh, unmuted. And Claudia, do you want to maybe stop sharing so that if she wanted to come off video, we could see? Yes. Mandy, I have a question. Yes. Do you want to share, like, how would you suggest that people get started? Like, how do you, what's that conversation look like? Like, asking somebody to be their mentor. You know what? I think it could be simple, but it's a little bit brave. Hey, I admire the way you do your work. Do you think that we could meet for an hour and talk about a way that we could work together in the future? Do you think we could meet for 20 minutes? Do you have time for coffee? I think it could be that that simple. Um, and again, don't worry about Barn and Jack. We're all willing to lend them. We're not going to charge you any money and we're not going to start screaming, but don't be afraid to reach out. Or if you need someone to help you make a connection, if that can be a little bit scary, you can reach out to any member of the board, anyone that's on this call and say, hey, so-and-so is in my area and I, I would really like to, to get to know them better. I think that we could be a great resource. We can we can help you make that connection. You know, we're here to, to hold hands and walk through this journey together. You notice all the roads in the presentation, our journey. Um, so we can facilitate it two ways. We can we can reach out with you together or you can just reach out and say, hey, I admire your work. I'd like to see if we could meet. Nicole, thank you for the clapping. So, so Mandy, I, I found myself occasionally becoming a uh, involuntary mentor. Mm -hmm. um, how many people on this call have found that happen to them? Because, you know, you realize sometimes, hey, they're, they're actually looking up to me. So uh, that's a huge one, too. And sometimes it just kind of, you know, taps you on the shoulder a little bit. So has there been a time like that for you, Mandy? You know, I think that when you're available, when you actually do pick up the phone or you respond to the text, I think that people learn that you you mean what's behind your words. 
hey, you can call me and I'm going to help. And I think that when they feel that that welcoming, um, you're like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to call back to this person. I'm going to text them again because they helped the first time. And when you have somebody that comes back to you a second time, you're like, oh, I didn't blow it the first time. We must be doing something right. And then it's also encouraging as a mentor. You're like, wow, I really want to help. And then you also want to learn. You're like, hey, if I'm going to answer that question, where do I find that answer? Is it something that I'm making up in my mind? Well, this is how I've always done it. But maybe I should find out how I'm supposed to be doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to ask if anybody on this call, actually, I know Mandy gave you some great tools here on the meeting um, in regards to making up a plan if you're going to do some formal mentoring. But if you have tools that you use that you are willing to share, please send them straight to me. I would love to have them and I will share them with the group that's been on today. I'm going to put my um, email address in the chat. We would love to be able to share that with everyone on the call. And that way, you know, you don't feel stuck with just one one format. If you're not comfortable with the format Mandy gave, which is very simple, um, you know, there might be others out there that we're willing to share. You know, I, I think that's a great point that when you offer to mentor or be, be technical assistance, it could take months before somebody takes you up on it. That's Again, right. they're they're a little bit afraid and it takes years to develop these relationships. If you think about all the people, you know, on this call, just on this call, how long has it taken you to feel comfortable to say, hey, can I can I talk to you about this? I have a question. I could really use some help because we have to develop that personal relationship, that trust, that empathy. I know that this person isn't going to think I'm crazy because I can't find this. Um, you know, it, it takes a while. I'll tell you, this was a great learning experience for me. There's so many things I'd like to go back and do differently and breaking it down and making it simple. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. All right. Is there any other questions before we move to the last couple slides here? Thank you, Danielle. Sweet. All right. So we want to remind you of a couple resources, um, and I know that Mandy did mention these on the on, during her presentation. But the Child Passenger Safety Learning Portal at carseateducation.org is a great resource for community education as well as CEUs. And you also can um, view some things for the school bus curriculum if you're interested in that as well. Through the Child Passenger Safety Learning Portal, there is a link to Safety Connection, or you can go straight to Safety Connection from the website on the screen. Safety Connection is your resource for everything you need to do in the field. There are pages available to you um, or to caregivers, to um, certain ethnic uh, origins. Uh, American Indian Alaska Native is one of the pages we have currently placed on there. But feel free to go shop that. And by all means, if there's something that you think that you need on there that I don't already have on there, we'll be happy to add it. Again, the National Child Passenger Safety Board, um, they can help you with the National Digital Check Form information, um, CEU information, webinars, things like that as well. Um, and then the Child Passenger Safety or the Cer Safe Kids Certification website, which does provide you with your resources for course curriculum development, as well as your recertification. And I know that a lot of you on this call are, have already been through all these sites, but we may have some new people on here that haven't actually went through their first recertification cycle, and I wanted to provide that to you. Um, as a reminder, this particular forum is available for community education uh, credits towards your recertification, so um, feel free to use that as well. Um, upcoming forums in March, we will be having Tammy um, Franks from the National Safety Council with Brittany. Um, Lombard, excuse me, and Ceci Velez are going to talk to us about creative uses of child passenger safety awareness trainings in the field. Um, the National Safety Council and the Child Passenger Safety Board have worked really hard to provide some some things that you could use in the field with your programs that you have. So they're going to give you some creative ways to use that in the field. In April, we're going to be visited by Cass Herring, who's going to talk about course administration, and she's going to talk about the good, better, and best of that. And so bring your questions because she's really wanting it to be interactive, and uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing her in April. You can always register for these at cpsboard.org forward slash webinars. There's also a link at Safety Connection if you want to go there. Um, the QR code on the screen will take you straight um, to Safety Connection actually there, I think. I think that's a safety. No, that's the webinars. Um, so 
I appreciate y'all's time today, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed um, the very first forum. If there's anything that you would like to see in the forums, please send it to me, claudia.summers at nsc.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mandy, for your time today, and uh, we hope to see you in Feb in March. I should say, I think it's January <laughs> in my head. So, um, this will be recorded and it will be posted at the Learning Portal, Child Passenger Safety Learning Portal, in case you want to see it then. Mandy, are you okay if we share the slides as well? Yes. Okay, they'll be posted in there as well for you to download. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. You want to stop recording for just a second? I have a, a little message.